his chest. And so his chest got so tightly squeezed that it caused him to pass out. And as soon as that happened, his arms that were holding that harness in place, well, his arms went limp, and then the wind whipped his arms over his head, and the harness immediately slipped up over his shoulders, off his head, off his arms, and he went flying 125 feet all the way down to the water below where he died. There were at least... Swaggy React, so we are, y'all already know what time it is, baby. <laughs> we are back with another reaction video, man. And yo, we back with another Mr. Ballin' video, man. Yo, like I know he dropped one before this one too. I know he dropped one before this one too, but we just gonna get to this one today. This is the most recent one that he just dropped, like literally, like today. You know what I'm saying? Like they tried to jump over it. So... And from the uh, thumbnail, it looks like some crazy stuff, bro. And you know Mr. Ball is going to always give us a great story. So, like, sit back, like, relax, go get your popcorn. Like, like go get your drinks, lady, let your hair down, fellas. Like, you know, like, roll up something if you got to. You know what I'm saying? Handle your business. You feel me? But, like, if you guys like these type of, uh, you know, you know, like, scary videos and scary stories, man, you're, you're definitely tuned in in the right channel. I need you guys to hit that subscribe button, man. I, I'm trying to reach 50K. You know what I'm saying? I'm very consistent with these scary hours because I know that's what you guys want to see. You feel me? But but without further ado, man, let's go ahead and get into this thing. Shouts out to the homie again, Mr. Night. I mean, damn, like Mr. Nightmare. See see what I'm saying? Because I still got a video to do with Mr. Nightmare, too. Like, that's the uh the trick-or-treat horror stories. I, I got y'all, bro. Trust me, bro. I got y'all, bro. Like, just because they dropped, dropped them, I, I got y'all, bro. You feel me? You feel me? So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into this thing. Let's get it. Today's video is brought to you by Current. Today, we're going to look at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways. But okay. before we get into okay. today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious deliberate and story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload one or two times every week. So if that's of interest to you, the next time the like button has an itch on their back, offer to scratch it for them, but then continuously misunderstand their directions so you oh. never actually itch the right spot. Bruh, that is so annoying, bro. Listen, bro, I ain't going to lie to y'all. Before I got my back square, I got a back scratch and I ain't gonna lie I just I'd be good but like bro like before then like, like when I used to get like like somebody to scratch my back they used to always get the wrong side like bro uh, 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 side 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 down, 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 down. Like, know what I'm saying? Like, bruh, like, oh my lord. <laughs> Continuously misunderstand their directions oh so you lord. never actually itch the right spot. Also, right. please subscribe to our no channel idea. and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. Let's get it, man. On January 1st, 2015, a family in South Yorkshire, England, gathered at a restaurant for their annual New Year's Day lunch. But one member of this family who said they would be attending didn't show up. It was 50-year-old Stephen Winfrey, who was an unemployed, divorced father of two, who in recent years had become quite depressed. When they reached out to him on his phone and he didn't pick up, the family pretty quickly started to worry that something could have happened to him, that, you know, perhaps he did something to harm himself given his mental state. But his sister, Nadine, who was at this lunch, she reassured the rest of the family that she had spoken to Stephen the night before and he was in great spirits and had told her that his plan was to go rabbit hunting the next day on New Year's Day before heading over to the restaurant for lunch. And because Okay, okay, but I, I just want to speak on this one thing as far as, like, depression. Like, depression is a real thing, bro. Everyone goes through it. You know what I'm saying? Like, even the, the celebrities with all the fame and popularity, like, they got, they still go through, like, depression as well. You know what I'm saying? Like, R.I.P. to Robin Williams. You know what I'm saying? But, 
But you already know, man. Like, depression is a real thing out here, bro. People, like, really suffer from that really, really bad. You know what I'm saying? For real. I just wanted to speak on that. Let's go the next day on New Year's Day before heading over to the restaurant for lunch. And because Nadine knew that her brother recently had really taken a liking to rabbit hunting, it was one of the very few things that actually made him happy, she told the family, look, I bet you anything he just lost track of time and he will get here late or maybe we won't see him at all, but at least he's out doing something that makes him happy. And so the family was reassured by this. And so they sat down at their table, they ordered their food and the whole meal, everyone's kind of looking over at the front door, expecting Stephen to come strolling in at any minute. But when they finished up eating, he still had not arrived. And so as the family was getting ready to leave the restaurant and head back home, they all decided that, you know what? I'm sure Stephen is fine. He's doing something he loves. I'm sure he did just get carried away. And so we'll just wait for him to contact us. And so the family, they all leave the restaurant restaurant and they spend the rest of the day at their respective households and then the following morning they all get in touch with each other and they discover that still no one has seen or heard from Steven and so at this mm. point the family just felt like there was something off about this so and so they contacted the police and they reported him missing as the police were getting ready to head out and begin looking for Steven that day they received a call. Stephen had been found. Although the exact details of what happened to Stephen may never be fully understood, this is the best theory that the police have come up with. On New Year's Day, January 1st, the day Stephen was supposed to meet his family for lunch, he had gotten up early and headed out to a nearby forested park to do some rabbit hunting, just like he told his sister he would be. He had gone to the park with his dog and some ferrets. The way Stephen caught rabbits is he would release these ferrets into various rabbit holes and then he would stand back with his rifle and he would wait for the ferret to run the rabbits out of their holes out into the open and then he would raise his rifle and shoot at the rabbits and then his dog would run over and grab the rabbit and bring it back to him and so all morning long he was doing this with relative success and then something happened to where Stephen decided he needed to actually look inside of one of these rabbit holes perhaps one of his ferrets got stuck or one of the rabbits got stuck but either way he wanted to to look into the opening of one of these rabbit holes and so he walked over to it and apparently he couldn't quite see whatever it was he wanted to see and so he got down on his hands and knees and stuck his head into this rabbit hole opening now these openings to these rabbit holes are pretty narrow and so once he forced his head inside oh, no. it got stuck he could not pull it uh, out i already seen that coming come on bro oh my lord Got his head stuck in a rabbit hole, bro. Bro, and so once he forced his head inside, it got stuck, he could not pull it out again. And so mm. all around the outside of this hole where his head was stuck, there were these deep divots that his hands had obviously dug once he realized he was stuck because he was trying to dig the entrance a little bit wider to get his head out. Mm. But as he was working really, really hard and laboring to kind of dig this hole out, he was burning up the very limited amount of oxygen that was inside of this hole. And so very quickly, as he was trying to save himself, he would have started to struggle breathing because there just wasn't enough yeah. air in this hole and so when it became clear he was starting to suffocate he abandoned the approach of trying to dig himself out and began trying to contort his body outside of the hole at really extreme angles to try to pop his head out even if it meant breaking his neck in the process but no matter how hard he tried he just Bro, couldn't and like look how small that hole is you're gonna force your head in there like no bro you got a big ass chromosome but you're gonna try to all right bro all right bro at really extreme angles to try to pop his head out even if it meant breaking his neck in the process. But no matter how hard he tried, he just could not get his head out. The following day, January 2nd at 4 p.m., this is after Stephen has been reported missing, a person walking through that forested park, they found Stephen. They saw his body poking out of that hole at a really extreme angle. And so they called the police. The police showed up to the park and they confirmed that Stephen was dead. He had suffocated. His death was not ruled a suicide. It was determined to be an accident. As for Stephen's dog and his ferrets, they were found near his body and they were unhurt. Before we get into our next story, I want to talk about oh, today's man. sponsor, Current. Nowadays, virtually everything we do in our lives is done in all agree 
virtually every we evolve. Banks still bankrupt. Those scary reward can be. Should be. This is you go download receives. Brian Joplin was born in 1972 and was raised in this tiny town in Oklahoma called Hugo. He was a big guy, so growing up, he was always encouraged to play football, and he did, but his real passion had always been working on cars. It was something he loved to do, and he was extremely good at doing. After he graduated high school, he stuck- I mean, I mean cause it's hard to find some good mechanics nowadays, I'll tell you that. Some good mechanics is hard to find, bro, I ain't gonna lie to you. Around in Hugo doing some auto body work, but he got this feeling that he should do something bigger with his life. And so in 1992, he decided to enlist in the United States Navy. This was something his family was extremely proud of him for doing, especially his grandfather who had flown bomber planes during World War II. Following Brian's initial military training, better known as boot camp, he was sent to Aviation Machinist Mate School, which is a military school for military members that teaches you how to be a mechanic for all things that fly. And so after Brian breathed through the like that is so dope right there bro for all things that fly that is just so dope right there bro that is dope it teaches you how to be a mechanic for all things that fly and so after brian oh. breezed through the school because he was already a very skilled mechanic and so it came to him naturally he was sent to his first duty station out in California. And so he joins his California unit and immediately he excels and he becomes one of the very best mechanics at his unit, despite being one of the most junior. And while he was in California, he also met his wife, Belinda. And so over the next several years that he was in California and then he moved around to Texas and a couple other places, he just continued to shine at work. And at home, he and his wife began building a family. They had two daughters. And so by and large, every Everything in Brian's life was going exactly to plan until Brian made a terrible mistake. Fast forward to October 4th, 2005, and Brian, who was 32 at the time, was deployed with his unit to Bahrain, which is a country in the Persian Gulf. That particular day, Brian, along with two other mechanics from his unit and two pilots from his unit, had been tasked with flying from Bahrain north to Kuwait, which is another country in the Persian Gulf. This was a routine flight about an hour long. It was one they had made several times during this deployment. Brian was not really looking forward to doing it and neither were the other people that were on this particular flight. But Brian decided the way he would make this trip less monotonous and boring is he would perform the stunt. So Brian and the other two mechanics, they load in the back of this helicopter in the cargo area, so the passenger area of this helo, and the two pilots, they load into the cockpit. And within a couple of minutes, they were 125 feet off the ground, careening forward out over the Persian Gulf at over 120 miles an hour. Brian and the other two mechanics in the back of this craft had elected to keep the back loading ramp that folds up and down to allow people to come in and out of this helicopter. They had decided to keep it down for this flight. So basically, they had this huge opening that just looked straight down to the earth. But this is a very common thing in the military. Lots of helicopters when they're flying around have either a side door open or the back ramp down because it provides an incredible view. And more importantly, it provides this amazing breeze inside of the cabin. A few minutes later, when the helicopter is way out over the Persian Gulf, Brian decides now is a good time to do this stunt. And so he looks across at the other side of the helicopter and kind of signals at the other two mechanics. It's super loud inside of the back of a helo. And so there's no way they could have spoken to each other besides with a headset. And they were not about to speak about the stunt over the headset because they didn't want the pilots to know. And so Brian signaled to the other two because they were totally in on his stunt he was about to do. And so they grinned and one of them pulled out a camera to be ready for what he was gonna do. And then Brian disconnected his helo lanyard. So inside of a military helicopter, you'll find all these metal eyelets, these little rings all over the floor, the walls, the ceiling. And these are there in order to attach cargo or strap things down or to attach yourself, a person, inside of the helicopter. And so the way you do that is by using your helo lanyard. It's this belt you wear that has this special strap that comes off the front of it. And at the end of this one or two foot long strap is a carabiner, a clip. And you clip that onto any of 
of those islets. And so that keeps you from flying out of the helicopter if the pilots need to maneuver suddenly or if you lose altitude, anything can happen inside. And so Brian removes his helo lanyard and then grabs the stretch of nylon rope. It was like a crudely built safety harness that kind of functioned like a helo lanyard in the sense that there was a carabiner on one end and on the other there was a way to attach it to yourself. But unlike it being this belt and kind of high tech system that attached to him, it was really just kind of a slipknot on one end of this 10 foot long line. And so Brian most likely had built this 10 foot long safety harness for this particular stunt or someone else had. But either way, he picks this up after detaching his helo lanyard and he puts the loop end of this 10 foot line, the slipknot end, over his head down to his waist and then cinched it tight. And then he very carefully stood up and walked towards the back of the helo. And then he clipped the end of this 10 foot line with the carabiner into one of the eyelets on the ground, right where the back ramp begins to go down. And so once that was in place, he turned and looked at the other two mechanics and gave them one more thumbs up. And then he got down on his hands and knees and he begins crawling backwards down the ramp. And so once he gets to the very edge of this ramp, so literally right behind him is just the open air. At that point, he grabs with his left hand one of those metal rings that are on the actual ramp itself. He gets a firm grip with one hand and then with his right hand, he grabs the side of the ramp or some metal framing there. And so once he had a good grip and he felt confident in it, he kind of slowly lowered his lower half until it slipped off of the ramp. And as soon as it did, the winds outside the helicopter, the 120 mile an hour plus winds, they immediately swept his legs up and kind of held them in the air horizontal like he was flying. And so he's holding on to the back of the ramp, but his arms are kind of tucked up near his chest. But once he feels his legs up in the air, he slowly extends himself. And finally, when they were fully extended, he was officially doing the Superman stunt. This was called Supermanning, what he was doing. And as soon as he was in this position, the other crew members inside of the helicopter, they knew this was it. Let's take some pictures. And so one of them got their camera out and took some pictures of him. And Brian knows he's getting pictures taken. He's holding on as tight as he can. And then after the pictures were taken and Brian looked up and kind of got the thumbs up that he was good, he began trying to pull himself back into the helicopter but he lost his grip. As soon as he lost his grip, those 120 mile an hour plus winds, they whipped him backwards and the safety harness that he had strapped around his waist, that's the only thing that caught him from flying away from the helicopter. And so Brian attempts to try to grab the ramp, but it's too far away. And as he's getting pulled by the wind away from the helicopter, that harness that was around his waist, it rides up until it stops right around his chest. And so at that point, he keeps his arms pinned by his side because he doesn't want the harness to slip up over his shoulders because right. then he will fall to his death. But because this harness was self-tightening, as he was whipping in the winds, the wind was pulling him so hard away from the helicopter that it was tightening that loop around his chest. And so his chest got so tightly squeezed that it caused him to pass out. And as soon as that happened, his arms that were holding that harness in place, well, his arms went limp and then the wind whipped his arms over his head and the harness immediately slipped up over his shoulders, off his head, off his arms, and he went flying 125 feet all the way down to the water below where he died. There were at least... Oh my god, bro. That is terrible. That's terrible, bro. That's terrible, bro. Oh my lord. 125 feet all the way down to the water below where he died. There were at least eight people that were punished for this incident, including the two crew members in the back of the helicopter taking pictures because they were totally in on this. But the details of the punishments were never made public. That's crazy, man. In the late 1860s, a group of rugged American explorers came out of the wilderness and went straight to a newspaper to tell them about this otherworldly place they had found. And so the newspaper sat down, they got their notepad out, and these explorers start describing this place. And they say, okay, well, it's this huge expanse of wilderness. And in the middle of it, there are all these boiling lakes that are either neon green or yellow or red or all of those. And they're shooting boiling water into the sky. And there are these breath 
breathtaking waterfalls and snow-capped mountains, and there are bison and elk and wolves and bears just free roaming the whole area. And so the newspaper, they take all this down, and at the end of it, they say, okay, guys, well, unfortunately, we don't publish fiction. But these explorers weren't lying. They were describing an area that we now know as Yellowstone National Park, which is this massive expanse of wilderness in Wyoming that sits on top of a volcano. And those boiling neon green, red, and yellow lakes really do exist. Those are hot springs, and they are the result of water passing by and making contact with underground magma chambers. Today, Yellowstone is so popular that every year, millions of people go to the park. And so as a result, the park employs hundreds of people year round to keep up with tourism. Many of these employees are young people, like college students. And in addition to being paid for their work, the park also offers them the ability to live in employee housing, which are basically dormitories spaced all across the park to make it easier to just be on site and do their job. And these dormitories are either free or very low cost. And so these young people typically take up that offer and will stay inside of these dormitories for as long as they're working at the park. And so in 2000, a 20-year-old summer employee named Sarah Hulfers, she was staying in one of these dormitories in the park and she was in her room when a group of other young employees that were staying in this dorm came down the hall and they knocked on her door and they asked her if she wanted to come with them to go swimming. And so Sarah, she had a day off and she wasn't doing anything. And so she said, sure, I'll come with you guys. And so after they all got their bathing suits on and got their towels and snacks packed, they left the dormitories and got into a couple of cars. And then they drove over to this dirt lot that was right up against this huge forest. And so they parked, they got out and they made their way over to this trailhead that begins in the parking lot and goes straight into this forest. And so they walked down this trail until the trail goes right out of the forest and brings them to the edge of this river. And this river was called the Firehole River. It was called that because the surface of this river steamed and it gave the impression that this river was on fire. The reason this happened is some of the water flowing through this river would pass by those underground magma chambers, warming it up. And so this is a lot like the hot springs, except on a much smaller level. The hot springs are boiling, whereas this river was just slightly warmer to the point where it would steam. So totally safe to swim in. So Sarah and the rest of this group, they come out of that trailhead and they're standing on the edge of this beautiful river and they walk down to the edge and they all jump in and they have this great day. They're swimming around, they're playing games and they were only expecting to be there for a couple of hours, but they were having so much fun that before long, the sun had gone down and they were still in the river. Damn. And so when it was dark out, they Jesus. finally climbed out. They was literally in that pool. That junk, all day. I know y'all are prunes right now, bro. Ain't no way. Y'all was in that water all day. Nah. That's crazy. ...to be there for a couple of hours, but they were having so much fun that before long, the sun had gone down and they were still in the river. And so when it was dark out, they finally climbed out of the river and they toweled off. And then they realized they had a bit of a problem. Because they did not expect to be there for as long as they were, no one had brought flashlights. And the way back to the parking lot would be going along that trail through the forest, but that was a pretty far trail and it's totally pitch black out. There's no ambient light. And realistically, there's some pretty big animals that live inside. I mean, so what? No, no. Like, my thing is, like, what? Like, I don't care how much fun I have. Like, if I can't see and I know I need to get home, I'm leaving early, bro. Ain't no way. It'll be here tomorrow. So it's like, bro, no, nah, hell no, nah, bro. Like, these people crazy. I don't care how much fun I'm having. But like, well, like, it's to the point that it's pitch black outside. Nah, bro. Nah. Blackout. There's no ambient light. And realistically, there's some pretty big animals that live inside hey, of that no forest. And so there? some people in this group were a little bit nervous about walking through this forest. But ultimately, about half of the group said, you know what, whatever, let's just run through the forest and get back to our cars as fast as we can. I'm sure nothing will happen to us. And the other half decided they would look for an alternative route that would skirt the forest and allow the moonlight to be their guide along the way. That second group was made up of Sarah, along with two 18-year-old boys named named Lance Bucci and Tyler Montague. So Sarah and these two boys, they're standing there and they're watching the first group go into the forest and disappear. 
And then she, along with these two guys, they turn right and they begin skirting the river and walking around the forest. And so they walk downstream with the river on one side and the forest on their left. And they're walking for a while until they see up ahead on their left, it looks like the forest is starting to thin out maybe a little bit. And so they took that as an opportunity to cut left and basically begin kind of going straight towards the parking lot, which was generally off to their left. And so they make that turn, they start walking and the terrain is relatively open. It's this big, open field with a couple of trees here and there, it was pretty easy to navigate. And they felt like, hey, we found a great alternative route. The moonlight's still shining through. We got great visibility. And so they're walking along happy as can be. And then they see there's a couple of streams up ahead. They get to the first stream and it's not that big. So they jump across it. They get to the next stream. It's still not that big. They jump across that one. And then they get to this third stream and they realize, you know, it's still pretty small, but it's significantly bigger than the last two. And so if we miss time it we Whoa, could now i ain't gonna lie look if y'all ain't no athletes i don't think y'all gonna make it over this one i ain't gonna lie to you bro and it look uh all into it. Now, this was not some huge deal. They were already wet from having gone swimming, but they didn't want to jump in this stream. And so they considered walking off to the right and trying to find an area that was more narrow, they could jump across more easily. But they figured they were probably within maybe one or 200 feet of the parking lot. They couldn't see it, but they knew they were close. And they really didn't want to go farther and farther away to only have to just jump over this thing anyways. And so they decide, you know what, let's just jump across it. Let's just do it. If we fall in, we fall in. And so the three of them backed up from the stream to give themselves some running room and then they grabbed hands and at the same time all three of them ran forward and leapt across the stream and they cleared it they landed on the other side but the ground they landed on was kind of loose and soft and so it kind of crumbled underneath them and they all fell backwards into the stream in the darkness this stream had looked like the other two streams they had seen albeit a little bit larger and so they were not thinking this could be potentially hazardous if they fell into the water. But it would turn out this stream was extremely hazardous. It was nothing like the other two streams they had encountered. This one was runoff from a nearby hot spring. And so the temperature inside of this stream was 178 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh. So it was practically boiling water and it looked like it was shallow. But in fact, this stream was 10 feet deep. And so when this trio fell into these scalding waters, they let out blood oh. curdling. Oh my scream. God, no, bro, what? Oh my, 178 degrees for one, 170. And then it was 10 feet, so, oh my Lord. Oh my God, that just gave me chills, bro. That just gave me chills, bro. I'm not going to lie to y'all, bro. Oh, whoa. Eight degrees Fahrenheit. So it was practically boiling runoff from a nearby hot spring. And so the temperature inside of this stream was 178 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was practically boiling water and it looked like it was shallow, but in fact, this stream was 10 feet deep. And so when this trio oh fell into Lord. these scalding waters, they let out blood curdling streams and the other group that had ran down the forest path, they had got to the parking lot and were waiting for them. And so they hear this scream and they just take off running in the direction of the screams. They cut right through the forest and they come out to that field and they find Lance and Tyler are on the edge of the stream, desperately trying to pull Sarah out of the water. And so the parking lot crew, they run over and they grab Sarah, they pull her out. They don't really know what's happened. They don't know this is some boiling stream, but it very quickly dawns on them when Lance and Tyler and Sarah just continue to scream outside of the water that something is horribly wrong. And so one of the people in the parking lot crew, they take off running, they go into one of their cars and they drive and they get help. And not that long after a helicopter would arrive and it would take Sarah, Lance and Tyler to a nearby hospital. It would turn out Lance and Tyler, when they fell into this water, they only submerged up to their necks. And as soon as they hit the water, they immediately turned and got themselves out again. So they were only in the water for maybe a second or two. And these things ultimately saved their lives. Although they did still have burns over almost their entire 
entire bodies. They had to go through dozens and dozens of surgeries and years of rehab, and they had to pay all this money for medical bills. So it was not a smooth course after they got pulled out, but they lived. As for Sarah, she was not as lucky. When she fell into the water, she completely submerged. Her head, her body, all of it went under the water, and then she just could not get herself out again. And so she stayed in the water much longer than the guys did. When she was admitted to the hospital, despite the fact she was talking and conscious, the doctors very quickly realized they had a big problem with her. A third degree burn or a full thickness burn is when the outer layer of skin gets destroyed and also the inner deeper tissues of the skin also gets destroyed, including the cells that are responsible for reproducing skin. And so if you get a third degree burn, that part of your body will not heal on its own. You literally have to get a skin graft and a skin graft is effectively a skin transplant. They will take other sections of skin from your body that are unburned and they will place them over that site where you have the third degree burn. But when Sarah was wheeled into the operating room, it was determined that she had third degree burns on 100% of her body. So there was no unburned skin. to use for a skin percent of her body. So there was no unburned skin to use for a skin graft. Her whole body was ruined. And so despite their best efforts, Sarah would pass away 15 hours after arriving at the hospital. A year later, Lance's family would sue the National Park Service for not having put up a sign exactly. near that particular oh stream. My God. I, was th I was thinking that, but I was just too in shock on what was going on, bro. Like, why don't the... the the uh site had shit like this bro around you should have automatically had that bro but yeah i i, I mean i feel like they should have something yeah yeah i feel like they should get like compensated for that bro they could have lost their lives too like oh my god poor sarah man the national park service for not having put up a sign near that particular stream to right. warn people of its dangers right. but that lawsuit was tossed out because it was determined that the trio sarah tyler and lance had chosen to walk off trail in a known thermal area and so they were being negligent not nah, the park. Bro. so that's nah, gonna do bro. it guys nah, if you bro. hell no nah, bro no bro i don't agree with that i ain't gonna lie to y'all bro i don't agree with that like it doesn't matter like like they was just trying to make it back home and like 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 sarah lost her life and her and like her like family and friends can't get compensated for that because john says say say she did it like under their own will man kiss my man whatever bro no, Sarah, Tyler, and Lance had chosen to walk off trail in a known thermal area, and so they were being negligent, not the park. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, that's let us know crazy, in the comments man. section what it is and where you found it, so give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comments section. If you got something out of today's video and you haven't done this already, the next time the like button has an itch on their back, offer to scratch it for them, but then continuously misunderstand their directions so you yes, never sir. actually itch the right spot. Also, please subscribe to our channel and- Yes, sir, man. Shout out to Mr. Ballin, man. A beautiful, like another crazy stories, man. He always comes up with these crazy stories and we never leave disappointed, bro. I'm telling you, man. RIP to everyone who lost their life life like or whatever you know what i'm saying and um like 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 yeah like that last one made me mad about them not getting getting compensated for whatever like for what happened to sarah and what happened to the other two people man but let me know what you guys thought about this reaction man by liking or disliking the video let's get this video to 200 likes man and let me know and, and trust me like the other videos are coming i mean i'm kind of like i said earlier like with the other mr baller video uh like like mr nightmare i got y'all bro trust me i got y'all make sure you guys are tuned in tomorrow when i drop another one at, at 11 p.m gang and srt gang i am out this thing man let's get it